So the wait's finally over. Tax Flux is now shipping and in the next four to six weeks, it should be available all around the world. So going back to the future or back to the past at Eurobike, this is one of the hottest talked about items. Mid-range smart trainer with a really, really competitive price point. Let's go through the stats. So obviously direct drive trainer, rear wheel off, dual broadcasting on Ant Plus and Bluetooth Smart. So tax are claiming about a 5% power accuracy with this, but that really tightens up after about 10 minutes of usage when things warm up, closer to around two to three percent. We will check that in our tests. Uh, 1500 watts sustained sprint power, so this thing can pack a punch. If you're putting out 1500 watts on the indoor trainer straight up and down, you're putting out a lot more on the road. So this thing will be more than sufficient for a lot of sprint work. 10% uh, grade simulation, seven kilo flywheel with an effective flywheel of 22.8 kilos. Now, that doesn't actually mean a lot to me either, to be honest. It's all about jumping on the bike, what's the spin down time, what does it feel like to be on top of the gear? We'll go through that as well today. Uh, the weight of the box itself, 25 kilos, so hauling this around is quite hard. Um, it's got some handles on the side, which is handy. Um, also, note that the flywheel is only seven kilos, and with an entire box weight of 25 kilos, I suspect the build of this unit is gonna be pretty solid. Also, standard compatibility here with a 130mm road bike, 135mm mountain bike, and also through axle compatibility with the T2835 adapter from Tax, if you need one of those. Unit doesn't come with a cassette, so if you're gonna buy one, also make sure you get a cassette. I've bought myself an Altegra 1125 for this unit. Okay, now for the fun part. I haven't opened this box yet, so come with me now. We'll open the box, we'll build the unit, put a bike on, see how we go. So unfortunately, we're not in the Llama Cave today. I'm still up in Sydney, but we'll make use of this room here and get into it. We have a manuals. Uh, we have all the tools required to build the unit. We have all the tools here. We have the lock rings, tool to build the unit, shims, spaces, and everything good to go. My customer support and the manual. As we know, manual comes out last. Now, Power cable, Aussie power plug. Thanks guys, that saves me a lot of time. Now, into the unit itself. Let's have a look how we're packed. It's packed in nice and tight. Let's see how easy it is to pull out and build. <clears throat> okay, obviously the feet of the unit itself. I don't know where the handle is, so let me grab it by the cassette. Pull it up. There we are. Nothing else in the box. It's all straightforward. No tricks up their sleeve. Brilliant. Leave that out of the road. Okay, now as I said, the manual's the last thing we go for, so let's try and build this from scratch. Uh, Multi-sys Edco hub on here so it's compatible with Shimano and most Campags. Uh, this looks pretty straightforward to install actually. Oh they're actually, yeah now as I said the box is actually quite heavy. They are rock solid. So don't let the plastic cover fool you. This thing is rock solid. It just has a nice outer casing on it. So that's all good. So I assume that goes in there. Hex key here looks like about an 8mm off the top of my head, and we have the two bolts there, so straightforward about what we have to do for here. Two bolts in and done it with the tool. Pretty universal power connector there, just uses a standard uh, old, old computer style. I think these are IEC plugs. 
So that build was pretty straightforward. It will take a few minutes. If you want to pack this away nice and tight in the car or back in the box, it will take a few minutes, but they have supplied the tool for that. So keep that nearby if you ever plan to take the feet off this thing. That's about it for construction, and it's time to put the cassette on. Okay, so we better do things by the book here, just to be sure. We're going Shimano, 11 speed, no spacer required. And we need the 11 tooth. Okay, so I'll get that. So that's the 12 tooth, we need the 11 tooth. Now these multiple compatible ones are tricky to find exactly where to fit them in. But once you've got one in, you're right. Okay, so that's where the large cutout goes. So, slides in. And we'll use the strong steel skewer that comes with it as well. Rocks all of these things. Okay, there we go. Now I do like a simple build process. If you've seen my other videos where I've put things together and had to read manuals from different languages, things can get a bit tricky. That was straightforward, so thumbs up to tax for that. The only real tricky part is getting the cassette on with the Edco hub. The multiple compatibility means it's got different teeth in different spots. It's not as easy as putting the large cutout onto the large cutout on the Shimano's if you're fine with that. But if you're buying this from a shop, get them to install it for you. No hassles at all. So I guess there's one thing left to do. Let's go for a ride. So one metric I did want to know is the rear axle height comes in at 34 centimetres. That's exactly the same as a road bike sitting on level ground, meaning you won't need a front wheel chock to lift things up to make it level, but my preference is always to have it up a little bit anyway, so I'm going to use the chock that came with the Neo. Another thing I'm keen to check on the Flux versus the Neo. On the Neo, the bike is up quite high and there's a bit of flex in the system. It's not a bad thing, it's just a little different to other trainers. Let's give this a bit of a shake, see how much play there is in the system. No, definitely a lot tighter. Definitely a lot tighter than the Neo there.
finish your first training session on the tax flux. Job done, hour 15, uh, took it up to the top of the Epic Com. Uh, had someone join me on the ride and try and race me to the top, so that's a bit of fun when uh, someone's added you on their friends list and they, uh, they join you halfway up a steep berg. Look, the 10% the was a pretty apparent. It really wasn't, a, really wasn't a slog fest. I've got a 39.25 on, so it's not really a climbing gear as such. But look, it was still a good workout. If I wanted to push back a bit harder, I just clicked down a few gears and went. But yeah, overall, not too bad. One thing I couldn't do though, I think I've got too many devices connected here. I didn't, couldn't do the spin down mid-ride. I disconnected everything I've got, but I've got five or six Bluetooth devices here, and I think something's hijacked the connection. So. I'm going to have to disconnect everything, start afresh, and uh, we'll try the proper spin down. But having said that, the power numbers um, over a steady state interval against the stages. Now, I've, it is a stages, but I have tested this against the Tax Neo, which is quite good for power. Um, and they were pretty much very, very close. And this was the same as well. They were bouncing around, you know, within five watts or so together. Um, so that was a good sign. One thing I did note, though, was just the lagginess of the, uh, the power reporting. When you get up out of the saddle and really punch it hard and try and jump across, the kind of thing that a strain gauge goes strain on, the power estimator goes, oh, hang on, let me think, let me stabilize, let me, oh, here's your numbers. So there's a little bit of a lag there. Maybe a firmware thing, maybe a Zwift thing, I'm not quite sure. But what I will do is map um, two head units I've got here with power and just track those along for a few different efforts, a sprint test, a steady state, and just a ramp up test. And, just see if there's any lag there. I'm not sure whether it was just visual or whether it was actually happening. On the downhills, no direct drive like the Neo, but it really doesn't need it. Once something lets go of all the resistance and it has some inertia and momentum in that flywheel, you're spinning out anyway. You sort of really have to push the pedals just like you do on the downhills. So not having the direct drive is not too bad. Uh, no road feel on this because it is a uh, belt driven. It'd be too hard to actually get a flywheel to start juddering. That'll do bad things for the uh, internals of the system. Look, I don't miss it though. This is about a hard workout. And, uh, oh, it's now, uh, what was that? An hour, an hour 20. Has been a hard workout. All right, we'll leave it there for now. Thanks for watching. I've tried to keep this one a little shorter than the others. So the next time around, we'll look at a few of the more in-depth details about the trainer, and we'll take it from there. Thanks for watching. Oh, quick update on this. I've just turned off all the Bluetooth devices I have in the house, which is a laptop, a couple of iPads, a couple of iPhones, and all my head units. And guess what? I can now calibrate it and connect to it. So I'll show you that process now. So it connected, calibration, calibrate your trainer right. Got to get to 30 Ks an hour. What happens at 30 kilometers per hour? My calculations are correct. When this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious shit. Can I get there? I can't even get to 30 kilometers per hour. There we go. All right, so calibration used to speed up to 30 k's an hour. Who would have thought getting to 30 k's an hour was so hard? <laughs> <laughs> All right, more testing to come. I think it might be Vaughn's turn to jump on here and do a workout. Let's go, Vaughn.